Dead America, Tales from New York, Peyton's Nightmare, by Derek Slayton. Chapter 1, Day 0, 10, 27 p.m. The heart of Manhattan pulsated with life, streets packed with cars as a rideshare SUV carried four animated 20-somethings. Parker and Landon, both impeccably dressed, sported perfectly styled blonde locks defying gravity. Peyton, the youngest of the group, donned her favorite blue dress, its shimmering sequins catching the glint of headlights and neon signs, accentuating her shoulder-length brown hair. But it was Kennedy who commanded attention, her 25th birthday marked by a birthday girl sash draped over her shoulders, a declaration to all who crossed her path. If I don't wake up in a strange place tomorrow with no clue how I got there, then I'm going to assume you all failed at your jobs this evening, Kennedy declared. Well, dear sister of mine, the first round is on me. Peyton chimed in. And I have the second Parker added. And if all else fails, I have some roofies Landon interjected, met with a collective groan from the others in the car. Despite the reaction, he couldn't help but crack a sly smile as Kennedy playfully smacked his arm. What? I just want to make sure you get exactly what you want for your birthday. Landon defended himself. Then find me a six-foot-two banking exec with a private plane Kennedy quipped, to which Peyton added, and give him the roofies. Laughter filled the car unexpectedly as the younger, shyer sibling delivered a witty punchline. As the mirth subsided, the vehicle slowed and pulled over. The driver, a middle-aged black man with weathered features, addressed the passengers. We're at your first stop, madam, he announced. Kennedy quickly objected, No, no, no. We're not doing that madam stuff. I'm only 25. And that madam stuff makes me feel like I'm my mother's age. You call me Kennedy. Okay, Kennedy, we're at your first stop. The driver corrected himself. Now we're talking, my man. Just hang out here for a few minutes while my sister and I run upstairs to collect our friends. Kennedy instructed as she and Peyton exited the vehicle, casting a glance back at the boys. You two behave now. Peyton teased. Never, Landon retorted. And frankly, you'd be offended if we did. Parker added with a smirk. Both girls laughed and nodded as they shut the door and headed towards the building. An eight-story brick structure that had stood for decades, remarkably well-preserved despite its age. As they approached the front door, a doorman greeted them, opening the door with a courteous nod. How in the world does Emma afford to live in a place this nice? I'd have to sell a kidney just to get them to show me an available unit, Peyton remarked as they made their way to the elevator. I think one of her grandparents passed away a couple of years ago and left her a nice chunk of change, Kennedy explained. We didn't really luck out with the wealthy family, did we? Peyton sighed. Kennedy chuckled as they entered the elevator, swiftly ascending to the sixth floor. As the doors slid open, they were taken aback by a young woman in scrubs who nearly collided with them, her attention consumed by her phone. Oh, I'm so sorry, the woman, Karen, apologized. Recognizing her friend, Peyton and Kennedy exchanged glances. Oh, hell no, Karen. You're killing me here, girl, Kennedy exclaimed. Startled out of her phone-induced trance, Karen looked up to see her friends and immediately noticed Kennedy's birthday sash prompting her to apologize profusely. Oh shit, Kennedy. Happy birthday, girl, Karen exclaimed. The two sisters stepped out of the elevator car, greeted by Karen's warm hug. So, lose the scrubs, put on something fun because we're going dancing. Kennedy exclaimed with excitement. I wish I could, I really do. But there's an emergency down at the hospital, Karen replied with a hint of regret. There's always an emergency down at the hospital, girl. They have an entire department devoted to it. They'll be able to manage without you for a night, Kennedy argued persuasively. Didn't you ask for this night off like two months ago? Peyton chimed in, curious. Yeah, I did, but it's an all-hands-on-deck situation. There's a line of people out the emergency room door, and literally half the staff has called off tonight, Karen explained her tone reflecting the seriousness of the situation. Kennedy's expression turned a little pouty 
sticking out her bottom lip in an exaggerated manner. But it's my birthday, she protested. I know, and I promise to make it up to you. But I really do have to go. Lives are at stake, Karen emphasized, her sense of duty evident. You sound like a superhero when you put it that way, Peyton remarked, impressed. Karen chuckled as the elevator doors opened once again. Wish I could get paid like one, Karen quipped. Just promise me that if things slow down, you'll come out and get a drink with us. I'll even pay your cover charge. I don't even care. I just want you there, girl, Kennedy pleaded with sincerity. Even though Karen knew it wasn't likely to happen, she smiled and nodded in agreement. I promise that I'll try, Karen assured them. Good enough for me, girl, Kennedy replied with a grin. Have a good night at work, Peyton wished her. I'll try. You be safe out there, Karen replied before returning her attention to her phone. After the elevator doors shut, the two sisters continued down the hall until they reached a door, giving it a loud knock. I hope Emma is ready. I can't believe it's after 10.30 and I'm not drunk yet, Kennedy remarked. I told you we should have pre-gamed, Peyton teased. It's just not the same without the blinding lights, deafening music, and a row of men lined up across the bar to survey, Kennedy lamented. Like a predator on the prowl? Peyton quipped. Damn straight, I need to lock in my bad decision for the night before the vision gets blurry. Don't want a repeat of birthday number 23, Kennedy admitted. Was that the toll booth operator? Peyton teased. Shut up, Kennedy retorted with a laugh. I mean, in the right light, he. Peyton trailed off with a mischievous grin. Kennedy swiftly cut off her sister's teasing. I said shut up, she snapped. I couldn't tell he was wearing lifts until I saw them by the front door the next morning, Peyton continued, unable to contain her amusement. Have you gotten me a birthday gift yet? Kennedy redirected the conversation. Not yet, Peyton admitted. Then you can give me one right now by shutting the hell up, Kennedy insisted, her tone firm. Peyton couldn't help but let out a laugh, sneaking in a jab as she muttered, toll booth. I will leave you in the car, Kennedy threatened playfully as she pounded on the door once more. Where the hell is this girl? Kennedy grumbled impatiently. Finally, the locks on the door began to crackle to life, unlatching with thick metallic thunks. The door creaked open, revealing Emma standing behind it. Normally vibrant and bubbly, Emma now appeared disheveled, wearing a bathrobe with tomato soup stains down the front. The bags under her eyes could have doubled as carry-on luggage for an overseas trip, and the light behind them seemed dim. Upon spotting their friend, the sisters had very different reactions. Peyton immediately shifted into consoling mode, her expression filled with concern. Kennedy, on the other hand, seemed borderline offended. Oh hell no, you aren't doing this to me, girl, Kennedy declared firmly. I tried to text you, but... Emma's voice trailed off with an apologetic tone. Kennedy pushed her way into the apartment, nearly knocking down the weakened Emma, who sagged under the weight of illness. Peyton rushed in, steadying Emma to ensure she stood upright. Karen has already bailed on me, and I'm not going to celebrate my birthday without both of my best girlfriends, Kennedy declared. Emma looked defeated, the illness running through her body clearly taking its toll. I really don't feel like going out tonight, Kennedy, Emma admitted softly. I don't care. I didn't feel like taking the subway out to Jersey with you last month so you could go on that internet date, but I did because that's what girls do. They have each other's backs. Kennedy reminded her firmly. Emma sighed, realizing Kennedy wasn't going to take no for an answer. I promise I'll make it up to you, Kennedy, she offered weakly. Nope, you're not making anything up to me. You're going to throw on some outdoor clothes and go have a drink with me on my birthday, Kennedy insisted, her tone unwavering. Emma, feeling defeated yet sensing Kennedy's determination bordering on insanity, knew it would be easier to give in to her demands than to continue fighting. One drink and I get to come home, Emma negotiated. I'll take it, 
Kennedy agreed eagerly. And you're paying for the car home, Emma added firmly. We have a driver reserved all night long, so we'll get to the club, have a drink. Then Peyton will personally put you in the car herself, Kennedy reassured her. I can ride with you if you want. The driver appears to be a good guy, but you know, Peyton offered, understanding Emma's hesitation. Emma nodded gratefully, pointing towards her bedroom. Let me throw something comfortable on and find some shoes. Kennedy smacked her hands together excitedly, letting out a cheer. Peyton helped Emma back to her room to get ready. We'll be out in a few minutes, Peyton called out as they disappeared into Emma's room. Kennedy walked over to the window, looking out over the city, a big smile spreading across her face. All right, New York, I'm about to make you my bitch tonight, Kennedy declared confidently. Chapter 2 The car veered off the main road, the driver's attention fixed on the GPS screen, navigating toward their destination. In the back seat, the group was lively, save for Emma, who seemed barely conscious. While Kennedy, Landon, and Parker shared dating horror stories, Peyton grew concerned. I'm sorry Kennedy dragged you out here against your will, Peyton said, addressing Emma's subdued state. It's okay, Peyton. I'll survive, Emma replied weakly. I promise. After that first drink, I'll get you out of there and back to the car, Peyton assured her. Peyton glanced up toward the front of the car, meeting the driver's gaze in the rearview mirror, acknowledging his eavesdropping on their conversation with a nod of gratitude. The vehicle came to a halt at the side of the road, just a block away from the main street. Everyone peered out the windows, noticing a significant number of cars, but sparse foot traffic. Hey, are you sure we're in the right place? Parker questioned, scanning the area. Yeah, I thought we were heading to some kick-ass new club. Landon added, voicing his uncertainty. Kennedy silenced them with a smirk, raising a finger to her lips before rolling down the window. The faint thumps of bass filled the air as the glass descended, captivating the group. Kennedy and the boys bobbed their heads to the rhythm, feeling the music's infectious pull. You know your girl wouldn't lead you astray. Come on, there are drinks and bad decisions just around the corner. Kennedy exclaimed enthusiastically, enticing them to join in the excitement. The trio emerged from the vehicle, with Peyton assisting Emma. As Peyton leaned back into the car, she issued a directive. Please stay close to the club. I'm hoping to have her in and out within 10 minutes, Peyton requested, concern evident in her voice. Don't worry. I'll just park in that spot the next block up. You get your friend back to me, and I'll make sure she gets home safe, the driver assured her. You're the best, Peyton acknowledged gratefully. Just remember that thought when you sign for the tip, the driver teased, offering a playful wink that earned him a smile from Peyton. Peyton closed the door and turned her attention to Emma, who appeared a bit unsteady. She quickly steadied Emma by the waist, and together they headed towards the club. Are you going to make it? Peyton inquired. Yeah, just get me in there so I can make your sister happy, Emma replied with determination. Then it's home and bed for you, Peyton remarked. Or just toss me in a dumpster. As long as I'm lying down, I'll be fine, Emma quipped, eliciting laughter from Peyton as they made their way toward the front of the club, a nondescript building that seemed to have once been a warehouse. Before they could enter, a burly man in a black polo shirt blocked their path. Oh, hell no, I can't let you in here like that, the bouncer declared firmly. Like what? Peyton questioned, puzzled. Drunk off her ass, the bouncer retorted, eyeing Emma suspiciously. I'm not drunk, just under the weather, Emma protested weakly. Nice try. But that's not the first time someone has tried that line on me. You're going to have to find someplace else, the bouncer insisted, unmoved by Emma's explanation. She's telling the truth. My sister, the birthday girl, demanded. Peyton began, attempting to reason with the bouncer. Oh. The bouncer interrupted, his expression softening as he seemed to reconsider their situation. Peyton observed the bouncer, 
who emitted a deep sigh, appearing somewhat worn out by the events of the night. Oh? Peyton responded, curious about the bouncer's sudden change in demeanor. So your sister is the girl with the birthday sash on? The bouncer inquired, seeking confirmation. Yeah, that's her, Peyton confirmed. All right, go on in. She took care of the cover charge. The bouncer informed them, gesturing for them to proceed into the club. Turning to Emma, the bouncer's expression softened as he addressed her directly. I'm sorry that your friend doesn't have more respect for you. I can have a car waiting for you if you need it he offered sincerely. Emma managed a soft smile before succumbing to a fit of coughing. Peyton glanced at the bouncer, nodding appreciatively at his kindness. That's very kind of you, and a little concerning given how my sister can appear to strangers, Peyton remarked. Sadly, it happens more than you might think, the bouncer admitted with a sigh. Somehow that doesn't surprise me in this town. We appreciate the offer, but we have a driver for the night who is just around the corner, Peyton explained. At the very least, I'll be here to help her get to the car, the bouncer assured them. Peyton and Emma made their way into the pulsating club, the music swelling as they traversed the short hallway leading to a pair of double doors designed to muffle the street noise. A doorman swung the doors open as they approached, unleashing a wave of sensory overload upon them. The thumping bass of the electronic beats reverberated through their bodies, while the kaleidoscope of bright, ever-changing lights dazzled them from every angle. The onslaught of stimuli hit Emma particularly hard, causing her to feel dizzy and disoriented almost instantly. Peyton attempted to check on her, but her words were lost in the cacophony of sound. Emma's head spun, overwhelmed by the sickness gripping her in that chaotic environment. She signaled to Peyton that she needed to find the bathroom, her gestures urgent and frantic. Peyton started to follow, concerned for her friend's well-being, but Emma shook her head vehemently, insisting that Peyton join the others at the bar. Despite her instincts telling her otherwise, Peyton reluctantly acquiesced, torn between loyalty to her friend and the desire to respect her wishes. As Emma staggered towards the restroom, her vision blurred with each unsteady step, her head throbbing in time with the music. She bumped into a few people along the way, accidentally knocking drinks from their hands. Initially met with annoyance, the bystanders' expressions softened to concern as they noticed Emma's distress. It took Emma several moments to navigate through the crowd and locate the bathroom, weaving past a line of women waiting their turn. One of the women near the door took offense at Emma's apparent disregard for the queue, grabbing her arm and yanking her away forcefully. Oh, hell no. The line is back there. The woman exclaimed indignantly, her tone laced with irritation. Emma turned, her balance precarious as she locked eyes with the woman, silently pleading for help. Relief washed over her as the woman recognized her distress and sprang into action. Damn girl, what the hell happened to you? The woman exclaimed, concern etched in her features. I'm going to be sick. Emma managed to murmur weakly. Understanding the urgency, the woman wasted no time, supporting Emma's weight and guiding her into the bathroom, her voice cutting through the chaos as she shouted for assistance. Unless you want to get puked on, somebody needs to free up a stall right now, she called out, her tone commanding. With no response from the other patrons, the woman took matters into her own hands, forcefully opening a stall and compelling its occupant to vacate the space. Move now, she ordered, her authority undeniable. The startled woman on the toilet complied hastily, allowing Emma to lurch forward and release the contents of her stomach, the illness seizing her with relentless force. Once Emma had emptied her stomach, the woman offered her support, patiently waiting until Emma was ready to stand. Turning to another woman in the restroom, she issued instructions without hesitation. Go get her a bottle of water from the bar, she directed firmly. As she steadied Emma, attempting to discern her faint words, the woman's concern deepened as Emma's condition deteriorated rapidly. She watched in alarm as Emma's speech faded to barely a whisper, her eyes fluttering dangerously. I can't hear you, girl. What are you saying? She said, her voice tinged with urgency. 
But before Emma could respond, her body went limp, and the woman struggled to maintain her upright. Oh shit. Somebody go get the bouncer and see if she has anybody here. She commanded, panic rising in her chest. With trembling hands, she lowered Emma to the ground, frantically searching for a pulse as dread crept over her. Oh shit, oh shit. I can't find a pulse, she whispered, her heart pounding with fear. The woman persisted in her efforts, conducting chest compressions in a desperate attempt to revive Emma. Despite her relentless efforts, Emma remained unresponsive, her body limp and motionless. Suddenly, the bathroom door swung open, admitting a bouncer who swiftly assessed the situation, his expression grave as he took charge. We're going to need a medic in the women's bathroom. He barked into his radio, urgency coloring his voice. As the scene unfolded, Kennedy and Peyton entered, their reactions starkly different. Kennedy, perturbed by the interruption of her birthday celebration, stood at a distance with a mixture of annoyance and concern. In contrast, Peyton rushed forward, her voice trembling with worry as she called out to her friend. Oh my God, Emma. Emma. Peyton exclaimed. The woman administering aid apologized, her voice strained with tension as she continued her efforts. I'm sorry. I don't know what happened to her, she murmured. Peyton pleaded with Emma, her voice laced with desperation. Please, Emma, please be okay, she implored, her emotions raw. Minutes stretched into eternity as the woman persisted with the chest compressions, the tension thick in the air. Finally, Emma's eyes fluttered open, but to the astonishment of everyone present, there was no accompanying sign of recovery. No coughing, no gasping for breath, just vacant eyes staring back. Peyton's initial relief turned to confusion and dread as she witnessed the lack of response from her friend. As Emma lay motionless on the ground, her gaze eventually found the woman who had come to her aid, locking onto her with an unsettling intensity. Before anyone could react, Emma sprang up with startling speed, her teeth sinking into the woman's neck with ferocious strength. A gush of arterial blood sprayed forth, splattering Peyton's face in a gruesome display. Paralyzed with shock, Peyton sat in stunned silence, the metallic tang of blood lingering on her lips as she wiped it from her eyes. Pandemonium erupted as screams pierced the air, prompting several women to flee in terror, pushing past the bewildered Kennedy and the bouncer, both frozen in disbelief. Eventually, the bouncer rallied, his voice trembling as he urgently called for assistance. Code red, code red, women's bathroom, he shouted into his radio. Emma now transformed into a zombie, reached out, hindering another woman's attempt to flee by flailing at her leg and causing her to stumble to the ground with a thud. As the woman hit the floor hard, her friend continued her desperate dash towards the door, a piercing scream escaping her lips as Emma crawled atop her, sinking her teeth into the woman's vulnerable neck. Peyton remained frozen in shock, struggling to comprehend the gruesome scene unfolding before her. The harrowing sight of Emma viciously attacking another young woman finally broke her trance, her sister's frantic cries snapping her back to reality. Peyton, look out. Kennedy's urgent warning pierced through Peyton's bewilderment, drawing her attention to the now reanimated woman lying on the ground. Unlike the usual stillness of the deceased, this woman began to stir, her gaze fixated on Peyton as she emitted an eerie, excited moan, reaching out towards her. Oh my God. Peyton recoiled in horror, scrambling backwards on hands and feet into the sanctuary of a nearby bathroom stall. Meanwhile, the once helpful woman was now thrashing about, her intentions now malevolent. With a jolt of pain shooting through her spine as her back collided with the toilet, Peyton quickly recovered and used her foot to slam the stall door shut. Yet, despite her efforts, the creature's arm lunged through the narrow opening, preventing the door from securely closing. Peyton pressed harder against the door, hearing the sickening sound of bones snapping under the pressure as she strained to keep the creature at bay. Despite the excruciating agony she should have been experiencing, the woman made no sound of distress, only emitting fervent moans of anticipation. Her gaze, wild yet vacant, peered at Peyton from beneath the door, an unsettling hunger in her eyes. Kennedy. Are you there? Kennedy. 
Peyton's desperate cries echoed through the bathroom, her voice trembling with fear and desperation. Peyton's desperate calls echoed fruitlessly, drowned out by the cacophony of screams emanating from within the bathroom, intermingled with the relentless moans of the woman before her, hell-bent on reaching her. Peering anxiously through the gaps beneath the stalls, Peyton felt a flicker of relief wash over her as she noted Emma's absence. However, this fleeting comfort was swiftly overshadowed by a creeping terror upon realizing that the other woman, who had been viciously attacked, was also nowhere to be seen. With determination etched on her face, Peyton continued to exert pressure on the door, steadfast in her resolve to keep the frenzied creature at bay. Yet, as moments passed without aid arriving, her hope dwindled, her mind racing for any possible escape route should rescue fail to materialize. Her heart plummeted as the pulsating music from the dance floor abruptly ceased, replaced by a chorus of panicked screams. Oh my God, I need to get out of here, Peyton murmured, the urgency in her voice betraying her rising panic. Accepting the grim reality that help was not coming, Peyton steeled herself for action. Surveying her surroundings, she noted three vacant stalls to her left, their doors standing open. The grimy floor, littered with spilled beer and other unidentifiable liquids, was a minor concern compared to the imminent threat. Determination overriding disgust, Peyton assessed the narrow openings beneath the stall walls, recognizing them as her potential route to freedom. While bracing the door shut with her foot, Peyton carefully maneuvered herself lower, inching closer to the stall wall. With a concerted effort, she managed to slide one leg beneath the wall, her body pressed flat against the floor, her foot firmly wedged against the resisting door. Summoning her courage, Peyton drew in a steadying breath before executing her plan. She propelled herself across the grimy floor with urgency, maneuvering swiftly into the adjacent stall. With a surge of adrenaline-fueled haste, Peyton released her foot from the door just as the creature forcefully burst through. Its mangled hand reached out in a futile attempt to seize her ankle, but the extent of its injuries hindered its grasp. Pressing on, Peyton navigated through the stalls, emerging near the sinks in a flurry of movement. Anticipating an imminent attack, she braced herself for confrontation, yet to her astonishment, the ghoul remained trapped within the stall, thrashing wildly underneath the partition. Opting for caution over confrontation, Peyton took a measured step, angling for a clearer view of the stalls without provoking the creature. Though puzzled by its unexpected behavior, she didn't dwell on it, focusing instead on her escape. The distant echoes of screams reverberated from the dance floor beyond the bathroom door. Peyton edged closer to the exit, mindful of every noise she made. As she cautiously stepped into the corridor, Peyton seized the opportunity to gently pull the bathroom door shut behind her her hope resting on the slim chance of containing the creature within. Turning her gaze toward the dance floor, Peyton's thoughts echoed her inner turmoil. Oh my God. Chapter 3 Peyton stood frozen, her gaze fixed on the chaos unfolding on the dance floor. Creatures akin to the one Emma had transformed into were tearing into people, while others fed on the fallen victims. The pulsating lights overhead reflected off the pooling blood, casting macabre patterns across the venue. Amid the mayhem, Peyton observed frantic attempts by some to flee through the back door, only to be swiftly overrun by sprinting zombies, displaying an unnerving agility reminiscent of track athletes. Positioned near the bathroom door, Peyton found herself rooted to the spot until a sudden hand yanked her down to the floor. Before she could scream, another hand clamped over her mouth, silencing her. To her immense relief, the assailant turned out to be another clubgoer, a young man adorned in flashy attire, his face splattered with blood, yet his resolve unmistakable. He signaled for her to remain silent, and upon her compliant nod, he released his grip. Glancing past him, Peyton noticed two others, a man and a woman, similarly dressed but neither her sister or friends. With her mind racing, Peyton realized her foremost priority was survival even if it meant abandoning the hope of reuniting with her companions. The determined young man gestured for Peyton to follow, and she complied, hunkering down behind a low wooden barrier separating the bathrooms from the dance floor. As Peyton motioned towards the front exit, the man shook his head grimly, signaling it was not a viable escape route. 
His somber expression conveyed a message far graver than a mere dead end. It was a dire warning of imminent danger lurking beyond. Peyton nodded in agreement, her heart pounding with each step as she trailed behind the group of four. They moved cautiously, heading back towards the storeroom, a daunting 40-yard distance ahead. Their path was obstructed by a bar area littered with overturned tables, while to their left stretched a vast open space leading to the dance floor. With unwavering resolve, the young man took the lead, his determination overshadowing the fear that gripped the others. They advanced another ten yards until they reached the end of the wall, pausing momentarily. Peeking out from cover, the young man surveyed the dance floor, spotting horrifying creatures feeding on a fallen dancer. Quickly retreating, he gestured for the others to remain still, signaling the need for swift action. Drawing a deep breath, the young man turned to Peyton and the rest, motioning towards the distant door along the wall. Silently, he mouthed the word run before nodding to indicate their readiness. Peyton returned the nod, her focus solely on escaping the room alive. She awaited the young man's signal with bated breath, placing her trust in his determination alone. With the agility of a sprinter, the young man darted out from cover, leading them forward towards the door. Peyton attempted to push past the hesitant young couple ahead of her, but they froze in terror, obstructing her path. Her heart sank as she witnessed the horrifying scene unfolding before her eyes, the determined young man, tackled by three ghastly creatures, crashing into a table as they sank their teeth into him. Though Peyton remained silent, the couple in front of her erupted into panicked screams, calling out a name that didn't register in her mind. She watched in dread as one of the zombies, drawn by the commotion, turned towards them. Her heart lurched as she recognized the tattered birthday girl sash adorning the female zombie's neck, stained with blood from a grisly wound on her shoulder. As Peyton's gaze lingered, her stomach churned at the sight of her sister Kennedy, unrecognizable from the girl she once knew. A sizable portion of her face had been savagely torn away, her vacant eyes tinged with a flicker of rage. Before Peyton could fully process the horror, Zombie Kennedy emitted a guttural moan, hurtling towards the helpless couple on the ground. The man valiantly rose to shield his girlfriend, but his efforts were futile against the relentless onslaught. Despite the woman's desperate attempt to intervene, the unstoppable force of Zombie Kennedy crashed upon them, sending all three tumbling to the unforgiving ground. Peyton sprinted towards the front door, her mind devoid of anything but the primal urge to survive. She didn't dare cast a glance backward, refusing to dwell on the fate of her fallen sister, her focus solely on escape. As she neared the exit, a bouncer emerged, wielding a metal baton amidst a sea of bite marks, blood seeping from his wounds. With a startled cry, Peyton instinctively raised her hands in defense. The bouncer's eyes widened in astonishment. Oh shit, you're alive, he exclaimed. Peyton nodded vigorously as she lowered her hands. Yeah, I am, she confirmed. Then get out of here. And here, take this. The bouncer urged, tossing her a retractable metal baton from his belt. Hit them in the head. It's the only way to keep them down, he instructed urgently. Peyton nodded again, momentarily frozen in disbelief. The bouncer's voice snapped her back to reality. I said go. Now. He bellowed, urgency driving his command. Peyton dashed through the interior double doors, stealing a backward glance to witness the bouncer's decisive strike against a zombie patron. With a swift motion, she shut the door behind her, shutting out the chaos unfolding in the dance hall. Before her lay another gruesome tableau, a dozen bodies strewn across the floor in various states of mutilation. Some bore the telltale signs of zombie bites, while others displayed injuries likely sustained in the panic-stricken frenzy to escape. Taking a moment to compose herself, Peyton examined her new weapon, tightening her grip and testing its weight with a hesitant swing. The initial attempt lacked the necessary force, only partially extending the baton's length from the handle. Get it together, she muttered to herself, shaking her head in frustration before winding up for another strike. This time, she unleashed the full force of her swing, the satisfying sound of the extended weapon echoing through the hallway. 
Drawing a deep breath, Peyton cautiously tiptoed among the fallen bodies, her senses on high alert for any sign of movement. With each step, she scanned the motionless figures, ensuring none stirred back to life. As she approached the exit door, the ongoing battle in the dance hall took a dire turn. Peyton whipped around just in time to witness the bouncer, overwhelmed by two creatures, stumbling backward and crashing through the double doors in a tumultuous clash. The bouncer's anguished scream reverberated through Peyton, sending shivers down her spine. She watched helplessly as he futilely swung his baton against the relentless onslaught of the creatures, more of them converging on the brutal scene. Amidst the chaos, Peyton's instincts kicked in as she noticed several of the creatures bypassing the fallen bodies, their predatory focus squarely set on her. Without hesitation, she turned and sprinted. Reaching the front door, Peyton barreled through with all her might, bursting onto the street. Her eyes darted to the doorman, now under attack by two zombies tearing into his flesh, one of which looked towards her, letting out an excited moan before breaking towards her. With a surge of adrenaline, she swung the baton, the satisfying crack against the skull of one ghoul momentarily halting its advance. Ignoring the grisly scene behind her, Peyton dashed toward where she hoped the driver still waited. Thunderous crashes echoed behind her as she reached the corner of the block, her heart pounding in her chest. Glancing back, she witnessed a horde of creatures pouring onto the street, some indulging in the gruesome feast while others set their sights on her. Fear gripped her as she turned and sprinted down the sidewalk, the menacing footsteps of the pursuing zombies growing louder with each frantic step. With desperation gnawing at her, Peyton scanned the desolate road ahead, her heart sinking as she found no refuge in sight, only parked cars lining the empty stretch. Her options dwindled to nothingness, a sense of hopelessness enveloping her. Suddenly, a flicker of light caught her eye, accompanied by the blaring of a horn. Squinting through the darkness, she discerned a pair of headlights ahead, signaling to her like a beacon of salvation. As she drew nearer, relief flooded her senses. It was the very SUV that had transported her to the club. Glancing back, Peyton noted the relentless pursuit of the zombies, their ghastly forms closing in. With a surge of adrenaline, she bounded towards the vehicle, the door unlocking with a reassuring thunk as she approached. Without hesitation, she yanked open the backseat door and hurled herself inside, slamming it shut behind her. Panic-stricken, she screamed at the driver. Drive, drive, drive. The driver wasted no time, flooring the gas pedal and propelling the vehicle forward. As Peyton glanced out the window, she spotted a few zombies pounding their fists against the glass, their grotesque visages a haunting reminder of the horrors she had narrowly escaped. Peyton remained in the back seat, her mind reeling as she struggled to comprehend the events that had unfolded. She glanced down at her blood-stained hands, a mixture of grime and gore coating her skin. Brushing her fingers against her face, she recoiled at the sight of even more blood. The driver's gaze met hers through the rearview mirror before he reached for a towel from the passenger seat, handing it back to her as he navigated down the side street. Here, use this, he offered. Still in a state of shock, Peyton accepted the towel with a nod of gratitude. Thank you, she murmured. The driver glanced at her expectantly, his curiosity evident. I don't suppose you know what the hell is going on, do you? He inquired. Peyton sat in silence for a moment, grappling with the surreal images that plagued her mind, the sight of her sister, lifeless yet animated, among them. Finally, she shook herself out of her daze, forcing herself to focus. I don't know, she admitted, her voice tinged with uncertainty. My friend, Emma, the one you offered to help. She collapsed and died, I think. But then she woke up and started. Her voice trailed off, unable to articulate the inexplicable horror she had witnessed. Peyton struggled to maintain her composure as she recounted the horrific scene she had witnessed. She started attacking someone. There was blood, so much blood, she choked out her voice thick with emotion. The driver listened intently, his expression reflecting a mix of concern and disbelief. But where did all those things come from? They weren't all sick like her, were they? He questioned, seeking clarification. Peyton shook her head, 
her thoughts consumed by the chaos that had erupted. They got bitten. That's all I know, she replied, her tone somber. The driver's resolve hardened as he spoke, determination lacing his words. Well, let's make damn sure we don't get bitten, he asserted. Peyton nodded in agreement. That's probably a good idea. The car continued its journey, navigating through quiet streets lined with shuttered businesses and a sparse scattering of parked cars. In the distance, a main thoroughfare loomed, offering a semblance of civilization amidst the turmoil. As they approached a stop, both Peyton and the driver leaned forward, their gazes fixed on the main road ahead. A couple of taxicabs zoomed past at breakneck speeds. That's actually pretty normal, especially this time of night. Speed limit is more of a suggestion, the driver remarked casually. Suddenly, their attention was drawn to a taxicab careening through the intersection, its windshield besieged by two creatures and another embedded in the front grille. The cab skidded out of control, crashing headfirst into a nearby wall. The driver's panic was palpable as he bolted from the vehicle, pursued by the relentless zombies. Peyton and the driver watched in horror as the trio vanished around the corner. That, however, isn't normal. Chapter 4 The driver and Peyton remained frozen in their seats, their gaze locked onto the bustling thoroughfare a few blocks ahead. They observed as more taxis hurried past, pursued in vain by a group of zombies on foot. I can try and get us out of here if you want, the driver offered. Let's figure out what we're doing first, Peyton responded. Okay, that's a good idea. The driver acknowledged. I think it goes without saying that we need to get out of Manhattan. Probably New York City as a whole, but first problems first, she said. We could attempt to head for Jersey? The driver suggested. We're south of Central Park, which means it's either the Holland or Lincoln Tunnels. So unless you think you can get us 150 blocks to the George Washington Bridge, I don't think it's a viable option. Peyton countered but we don't know how widespread this thing is. The tunnels could be clear, the driver argued. And it could be a traffic jam. Look, if you want to go that way, I'm not going to stop you, but I'm certainly not going to be going with you, Peyton said. After a moment of contemplation, the driver nodded in acquiescence. All right, I'll stick with you, the driver affirmed. Isn't the Williamsburg Bridge only about 20 or 30 blocks from here? Peyton questioned. You want to head to Brooklyn? The driver responded, a hint of uncertainty in his tone. It's a lot more residential out there, so maybe we can get lucky. If whatever is going on is widespread, maybe it hasn't spilled out onto the streets yet. And then what? There's nothing in that direction except for people for a thousand blocks and after that it's the water, the driver pointed out logically. Peyton let out a frustrated sigh, acknowledging the validity of the driver's point. What about the water? Can we find a boat? Peyton suggested, grasping at any potential escape route. It's 45 degrees outside, the only boats that aren't in storage are boats they don't let people like you and me drive, and the boats on the other side of the island are private-owned and locked up tight. Plus, by the time we got there, the owners will most likely have departed. Damn it. All right, you're right, Peyton conceded. Peyton's mind raced, desperately seeking a semblance of a feasible plan. Eventually, she conceded with a heavy heart, her head dropping in defeat. I hate to admit it, but I think we have to make a run for Jersey, Peyton declared. We'll take our chances with the tunnel. There might be miles of people, but at least there's open country on the other side. You may want to buckle up, the driver said, prompting Peyton to buckle up obediently. She settled into her seat, her senses heightened as she scanned their surroundings for any signs of danger. With a sudden burst of acceleration, the driver threw the vehicle into gear, propelling them forward with urgency. Negotiating a sharp left turn, they surged ahead, the engine roaring as they navigated the streets. The Holland Tunnel is about 20 blocks or so up, as long as we don't hit too much resistance, we'll be there in no time, the driver reassured, his focus fixed on the road ahead. 
Peyton gripped the seat tightly, her gaze darting between the unfolding chaos around them. She witnessed frantic figures fleeing pursued by sinister shapes, their desperate cries echoing through the air. As they rounded another corner, Peyton's attention was drawn to a gruesome scene outside a lavish restaurant. A hapless victim was set upon by a trio of ghoulish creatures, their grotesque feast unfolding before horrified onlookers. The driver executed another sharp maneuver, wrenching the wheel to the left as they veered back on course. Tires screeched in protest as he fought to regain control, eventually steadying their trajectory. Glancing behind them, Peyton watched in despair as a young man fell victim to the ravenous onslaught of zombies in the middle of the road. Though unspoken, she was certain the driver had swerved to avoid him, though it offered little solace to the doomed soul. Wow. That was too close, the driver exclaimed breathlessly. Tell me about it, Peyton replied, her voice trembling with residual shock. Regaining his composure, the driver refocused, skillfully maneuvering through the increasingly sparse crowds of panicked pedestrians and menacing creatures. They made steady progress, covering five blocks before the external chaos began to subside. Closed businesses and dwindling crowds signaled their approach to a more residential area. We're only about 12 blocks away from the tunnel. It should be quieter there, the driver remarked, optimism tinged with caution in his tone. Before he could finish his sentence, a taxi barreled into the driver's side with tremendous force. The SUV careened off the road, flipping over onto its roof before skidding to a halt on the sidewalk. Peyton sat stunned, her senses reeling from the impact. Disoriented and dazed, she struggled to gather her thoughts. Come on, we need to get out of here, Peyton urged, reaching for the driver and shaking him in a desperate attempt to rouse him. We can't stay here, she continued, her voice tinged with urgency as she shook him more forcefully, only to feel him slump to the side. Oh no, please, not you too, Peyton whispered, her heart sinking as she leaned in closer to inspect him. A small spot of blood marked the side of his head, and his eyes glowed with an ominous red hue, indicating internal trauma. Surveying the mangled wreckage of the driver's side door, she spotted blood on a splintered piece of the door frame. With a defeated sigh, she was jolted back to reality by the sound of hands pounding against the vehicle. She flinched initially, but then relaxed slightly as she heard voices outside. Is everybody okay in there? A man's voice called out. Yes, I'm here in the back seat. Peyton responded urgently. With a collective effort, the door was pried open, revealing two men standing outside. One wore a worker's uniform with the name Justin on the patch, while the other, clad in a bloodied business suit, gripped a crowbar with a wild look in his eyes. The worker, an older white man with a friendly demeanor, knelt down and reached into the vehicle, assisting Peyton as she undid her seatbelt. Come on, Chad, let's get the driver and head back to the diner, Justin suggested. Forget the driver. I don't like being exposed like this, especially after that crash, Chad objected, his tone tinged with fear. The driver's dead. We need to get inside, Peyton interjected firmly. The girl's right. Listen to her, Chad said. Justin agreed, nodding in acknowledgement. With a sense of urgency, the trio swiftly made their way up the block towards an all-night diner. Inside, a few people watched intently, with a waitress poised by the front door, ready to unlock it. As they approached, the waitress began frantically gesturing towards their side. Chad turned to see a zombie hurtling towards them with alarming speed. Reacting quickly, Justin grabbed Peyton, pulling her back to safety while Chad prepared to confront the approaching threat. With precise timing, Chad swung the crowbar like a baseball bat as the creature closed in. The metal struck the zombie squarely on the bridge of its nose, sending it reeling backward, its momentum carrying its legs far past where its face abruptly halted. As the ghoul slammed onto the ground with a sickening thud, Chad swung the crowbar down with all his might, the impact cracking the creature's skull. With a victorious shout, the trio hastily retreated into the safety of the diner's interior. The waitress stationed by the door swiftly secured it, 
her gaze immediately returning to scanning the street for any further threats lurking in the darkness outside. Peyton made her way over to the counter, where the cook stood ready, promptly filling a glass with water and placing it before her. Here, girl, drink this. I'll get you a towel, the cook offered kindly. Nodding gratefully, Peyton downed the water, still struggling to shake off the fuzziness clouding her senses. As she tried to regain her composure, Justin approached and took a seat beside her. I'm Justin, and we're not going to hurt you, he reassured her gently. I'm Peyton, and I gathered that. Thank you for getting me out of the car, she replied, her voice tinged with relief. Chad, keeping watch by the window, scanned the surroundings for signs of danger, his tone firm as he spoke. You should be grateful. We risked our lives out there, Chad remarked forcefully. Ignore him. He's just having a rough night, Justin interjected, attempting to diffuse the tension. Peyton nodded in understanding. There's a lot of that going on tonight. The waitress chimed in, her voice carrying a note of concern. I don't suppose you know what's going on, do you, Han? Peyton drained the last of her water, shaking her head solemnly. The only two things I know, she began, her voice grave, is that if you hit them in the head, it tends to keep them down. And if you get bitten, you eventually turn into one of them. Immediately, all eyes in the restaurant turned towards a lone customer sitting in a booth, his middle-aged features etched with terror. Sensing the collective attention, he glanced down at his bandaged arm, a visible sign of recent struggle. As Chad and Justin started to approach him, the fear in the customer's eyes escalated into panic. Come on now, look at me. I'm not like those people outside, he pleaded desperately. Yeah, but you're going to be, Chad retorted bluntly, tapping his bloodied crowbar against his palm, the threat of violence hanging in the air. Before he could advance further, Justin interceded, stepping in front of Chad. Calm down, Chad, Justin urged, his voice steady despite the tension. I am calm. Chad insisted, his grip tightening on the crowbar. You heard the girl. If you get bitten, you turn into one of those things. And I don't want one of them running around with me in here. Turning to Peyton, Justin sought confirmation. Peyton, are you sure? Peyton nodded slowly, her expression grim, before finishing off her glass of water. I am, but the people I saw turn got bitten on the neck and bled out. Maybe you have to die first before you turn, she suggested, her words laden with uncertainty. Or maybe the bite kills you then turns you, Chad countered. Chad swiftly reached down, his fingers closing around the man's arm with a determined grip, pulling him out of the booth without hesitation. I'm not taking any chances, Chad asserted. Confusion etched Justin's face as he questioned, What are you doing? Throwing him outside, Chad replied, his tone resolute. Justin's protest came swift. No, no. Come on, Chad. What if a bite on the arm isn't lethal? Then it sucks to be him. But I'm not risking my life to find out, Chad retorted firmly. Interrupting their exchange, the cook interjected, Don't throw him outside. We can lock him up in the back storeroom. Chad paused, the weight of the decision heavy on his shoulders. Gripping his weapon tightly, he weighed the options carefully before finally nodding, shoving the man away and into Justin's grasp. It's only temporary, until we can get some help up here, Justin reassured the reluctant customer. Understanding the implicit threat, the customer complied, following Justin towards the back. As they shuffled away, Peyton addressed the tense group. Has anybody been able to get through to the police? There's nothing, it just goes to voicemail, the waitress lamented, her voice tinged with panic. Your tax dollars at work, Chad quipped bitterly. The group fell into a tense silence, each contemplating their next move, when the waitress suddenly cried out in distress. Oh God, they're coming. Everyone hurried to the window, their hearts pounding as they witnessed the horrifying sight of half a dozen creatures sprinting towards the diner. They recoiled instinctively as the zombies pounded against the glass, their teeth gnashing, arms flailing in a frenzied attempt to break through. 
The group stood frozen in stunned silence, the gravity of the situation sinking in. Uncertainty hung heavy in the air as they grappled with the terrifying reality before them, unsure of what to do next. Chapter 5 The group stood at the window of the diner, slowly inching away from it as they observed the scene outside. Is that door locked? asked the cook. Bolted up tight, confirmed the waitress. Let's just hope it holds, the cook replied, a hint of uncertainty in his voice. Several more creatures rushed towards the window, their impacts audible but none attempting to open the door except for one frantic zombie thrashing against it. Peyton and Chad moved closer, their gazes fixed on the struggling undead. Why isn't it trying to open the door? Chad wondered aloud. Peyton paused, her mind flashing back to the encounter with the woman in the bathroom, recalling how it tried to crawl under the stalls instead of exiting through the door. I don't think they're that smart, she reasoned. No kidding, Chad agreed, absorbing her observation. I'm serious. One of them could have easily caught me if it had just stood up and ran out the door. Instead, it tried to crawl, Peyton explained. So they just see prey and frenzy? Chad surmised. I think so, Peyton nodded. Good to know, Chad acknowledged, a newfound respect for Peyton's insight dawning on him. The waitress interjected, breaking the moment of reflection. What do we do? I just tried the police again, and nothing, the cook reported grimly. Justin emerged from the back, having securely locked up the bitten customer. Forget them, we have to assume that we're on our own, he declared. Does anybody have a car? Peyton inquired. Honey, this is New York City, and you're in an all-night diner. Nobody here can afford a car, the waitress replied sympathetically. Speak for yourself, Chad interjected. So you have a car? Peyton pressed. I do, but it's in the shop, Chad admitted. Then no, you don't have a car, Peyton concluded, leaving Chad momentarily speechless. I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm getting out of the city, Peyton declared. And go where? The waitress questioned. Jersey. Hopefully we'll get lucky and make it past the city into less populated areas, Peyton explained. You do what you want, sweetheart, but I'm hanging tight and waiting for help to arrive, the cook stated firmly. I don't know what this is, but it's happening everywhere out there, Peyton continued her tone urgent. It took a matter of minutes for a packed nightclub to be turned. When the sun comes up and people start going to work, it'll be impossible to get out, she warned. She's right. If we don't make a play for it soon, we're not going to have the chance. And I don't think those windows are going to hold against a street full of those things, Chad asserted. I'm staying. Those windows are solid, and we have plenty of food in the back. Help will get here eventually, the cook insisted. Yeah, you just keep believing that, bud, Chad retorted skeptically, exchanging a glance with Peyton as they conferred. We have no car, those things are multiplying outside, and the nearest tunnel to Jersey is about 15 blocks away. And even if we get there, it's a fucking tunnel, so if we somehow make it that far, I'm more inclined to swim it and risk freezing to death. So I'm open to ideas, Chad admitted, his frustration evident. We could try finding a taxi? Peyton suggested tentatively. Didn't work out so good for you last time. And besides, those assholes don't want to stop when it's peaceful outside. They aren't stopping for anything right now, Chad countered, dismissing the idea. What about the subway? Peyton proposed. Chad shook his head. The subway doesn't run over to Jersey, and certainly not to where we need to get to. That's not entirely true, Justin interjected, offering a glimmer of hope. Chad turned, fixing a curious gaze on Justin. Do you know something I don't? Chad queried. Apparently so, Justin responded, nodding toward the logo position just above his name, a transit emblem. Chad leaned in, scrutinizing the emblem until realization dawned, prompting a chuckle. By all means, enlighten us, Chad invited. There's a shuttle train that runs from a station to a subterminal on the other side of the water, Justin explained. 
How far away is it? Peyton inquired. Four blocks, Justin replied. With everything that's going on outside, that station is going to be a madhouse, Chad remarked. Justin's grin widened as he displayed a set of keys, which is why we're going to avoid the crowds. There's an employee entrance at the top of the station, lets us bypass the crowd so we can get to the train, Justin revealed. So even if it's packed at the platforms, we won't have to deal with it, Peyton noted. Are you sure the train is even there? Chad questioned. My train is. They put mine offline to do some routine maintenance, Justin assured. Okay, that's half the problem. When we get to that other station, then what? Peyton pressed. Justin contemplated the logistics. We're going to have to get over two platforms to the westbound extension. It's an express train that will get us outside the city. Is that train still there? Chad inquired. No clue, Justin admitted. What the hell? That's close enough to having a plan. I assume you're coming with us? Chad asked. Yeah. I couldn't afford to live here, so I'll be damned if I'm going to die here, Justin declared. And the rest of you. Chad scanned the restaurant, meeting the cook, waitress, and a few patrons, all shaking their heads no. What about you, Peyton? You up for a subway ride? Chad turned to Peyton. Peyton reached into her pocket, retrieving a retractable baton, which she extended with a swift motion. Chad couldn't help but chuckle at the sight of the petite woman, dressed for a night out, preparing for battle. Let's do it. And wipe that smile off your face, Peyton ordered. Of course, Chad replied, his grin fading. Chad's chuckles persisted as the trio made their way toward the rear of the diner. Their departure drew the attention of the others, who watched in silence until the cook gestured for the waitress to follow. Make sure that back door is secure when they leave, the cook instructed. The waitress nodded, trailing behind the three risk takers. Chad, Justin, and Peyton forged ahead, knowing they were sealing their own fates. Stopping by the back door, Chad took the lead, lifting the metal bar blocking their exit. Okay, when we get out of the door we're going left for two blocks, then hanging a right for two more. Subway entrance is at the street level, silver door beside the stairwell, Justin said. We're going to follow you, Peyton affirmed. As Chad reached for the door, Peyton halted him with a touch. What is it? Chad inquired. Peyton glanced back toward the waitress, her tone forceful yet sincere. If you are staying here, you need to kick that bitten man out. Or tie him up. Because when he turns, you're going to have a hell of a time getting to all that food you think you have, Peyton warned. The waitress pondered for a moment before nodding silently. Peyton sensed her internal conflict, torn between the desire to join them and the realization of her physical limitations. Good luck. And if you see a cop, would you mind sending them our way? The waitress requested as they prepared to depart. Peyton managed to force out a half-smile before nodding in agreement, signaling to Chad that she was ready. Okay, stay close and protect this guy because he's the only person who can get us to Jersey, Chad instructed as he gently pushed open the door, and the three of them slipped out into the alleyway. The waitress took great care in shutting the door quietly. The alleyway, though dingy, offered some relief as they found no immediate signs of movement. However, distant horns honking and sporadic footsteps echoing off the pavement unnerved them. As they approached the end of the alleyway, Chad's senses heightened as he noticed movement to his right. He tensed, ready to strike with his crowbar, but Justin intervened, halting his swing. They discovered a homeless man asleep beneath a pile of cardboard. Chad shook his head in disbelief before the trio pressed on. Upon reaching the end of the block, Chad halted them to assess their surroundings. Creatures ran towards the front of the diner on their left, while the right side seemed clear for a couple of blocks until the main thoroughfare. Though obscured, fires and frantic figures hinted at the tumult beyond. Chad signaled for them to proceed quietly. They emerged from cover, crossing the road and darting into the next alley. However, one of the zombies heading for the diner caught sight of them, emitting a loud moan as it began pursuit. 
Peyton urged them forward with a whispered move, and they hastened their pace. Peyton glanced back over her shoulder, prepared to defend if necessary. Yet, the zombie's attention was diverted by the snoring homeless man across the way, providing a momentary reprieve. The creature turned abruptly, fixating on the unsuspecting man and rushing towards him. Peyton averted her gaze before impact, but the muffled, confused screams of the man echoed in her ears as they hurried away. Chad guided them to the next block, exchanging a glance with Justin who gestured to the right and nodded. Surveying their surroundings once more, Chad noted the clear path in both directions leading up to the main thoroughfare. Emerging from the alley, they hugged the building's wall, their movements cautious and vigilant. The first block passed without incident, with only a potential threat spotted a block and a half away down a side street, which they disregarded as they pressed forward. As they neared the main road, Chad slowed their pace, picking up on noises ahead. Directly in front of them, the road appeared clear except for a wrecked taxi on the opposite side. Despite seeing no movement, they could sense activity nearby. Chad whispered to Justin, seeking guidance. How far up is the door? He inquired. Turn right, and it's half a block up on this side of the street, Justin replied quietly. Chad nodded, gesturing for the others to follow him. They cautiously approached the corner, Chad peering around it carefully. What he saw froze him in place. Three zombies were tearing into a taxi driver on the sidewalk near his wrecked car. They seemed entirely engrossed in their gruesome feast, just a few yards away on the other side of the subway entrance. Urgently, Chad glanced back at his companions, signaling them to be ready. Justin produced the keys, ensuring they made no noise as he readied the correct one. With Chad leading the way, they emerged from cover, moving silently but purposefully while keeping a wary eye on the zombies. As they closed in within ten yards of the door, one of the creatures looked up, sensing their presence. A low, guttural moan escaped the zombie's lips, alerting not only its companions but also attracting more undead from down the street. Run. Chad's voice pierced the tense air, and without hesitation, the trio sprinted toward the door, the zombies mirroring their movements. Chad made a split-second decision, stepping a few paces toward the road in an attempt to lure the zombies away and create space for Justin to act. His diversion worked, drawing one of the creatures towards him, leaving it slightly ahead of the others. With swift precision, Chad swung his weapon, connecting with a solid thud as it struck the zombie's head, sending it crashing to the ground. Justin dashed straight for the door, his hands swiftly working to unlock it. Peyton's eyes darted between the advancing creatures and Justin's struggle with the door. Realization struck her they wouldn't make it in time. Without a moment's hesitation, Peyton seized Justin, yanking him away from the door. Together, they stumbled backward, veering around the stairwell leading down to the subway. Chad. Peyton's cry pierced the chaos, drawing Chad's attention. He broke from his position, sprinting towards them. With perfect timing, he barreled into the first zombie, sending it crashing into its companion. The two undead horrors tumbled down the stairs, bones snapping amidst their moans. Seizing the opportunity, Justin hurried back to the door as the others formed a protective perimeter around him. That's quick thinking, Chad commended, his voice tinged with admiration. Peyton nodded in acknowledgement as they turned their focus to the approaching horde of zombies. How's that door, Justin? Peyton's urgency was palpable as the zombies closed in, their ominous presence looming closer with each passing second. We're in. Justin's declaration came just in time, the door swinging open to admit them. Chad wasted no time, forcefully pushing Peyton behind Justin as they all rushed inside. With a decisive slam, Chad secured the door, locking out the encroaching danger while Peyton positioned herself in front of Justin, ready to defend. The trio found themselves in a narrow hallway, sparse with only a couple of chairs and an office to the right. Straight ahead, about 15 yards away, stood an elevator, their gateway to the trains below. Chad's expression contorted in disbelief. You gotta be shitting me. An elevator to get down there. Justin responded with a nod and a smile. 
Chad's frustration was palpable. You didn't think to mention that before. Justin countered, unfazed. Would it have mattered? It's a better alternative to going down the stairs to the platform, isn't it? Chad molded over, reluctantly conceding with a nod. Yeah, well, I'm still going to bitch about it. Justin chuckled, gesturing for them to follow. With bated breath, they approached the elevator, relieved when the doors slid open to reveal an empty interior. Stepping inside, Justin pressed the button. As the doors closed, Peyton couldn't resist a morbid quip. Express elevator to hell. Going down. Chapter 6 The tension hung heavy in the air as the trio stood rigid in the elevator, descending down the lengthy shaft toward the platforms below. Chad edged past Justin with a determined step, prompting Peyton to follow suit once she caught on to his movement. Okay, girl, when those doors open, you be prepared for anything, Chad instructed, his voice steely with resolve. If there's only a handful of them, we'll take them out. And if there's too many to deal with? Peyton's voice wavered with uncertainty. Push them back and hope that the door is close, Chad replied tersely. Because we've had such good luck tonight, right? Peyton's retort dripped with sarcasm. Chad's lips curled into a smirk as he focused his attention on the imminent threat before them. Moments stretched on in tense silence until the elevator car finally settled into place with a subtle jolt, marked by a solitary ding from the bell heralding their arrival. The door slid open, revealing the dimly lit employee platform beyond, accompanied by the ominous sound of moaning. Without hesitation, two figures garbed in the same uniform as Justin hurtled toward them, Hit him. Chad's command rang out as both he and Peyton sprang into action, darting out from the confines of the elevator and positioning themselves strategically for the fight. With purposeful strides, Chad gathered momentum, his shoulder lowering as he prepared to meet the oncoming threat head-on. The impact of his collision sent the zombie careening, its form spiraling through the air before crashing to the ground with a sickening thud. In one fluid motion, Chad pivoted, brandishing his crowbar with lethal precision as he rained down blows upon the fallen creature's skull. Each strike echoed with the sound of breaking bone, until finally, the zombie lay motionless, its grotesque contents spilling onto the unforgiving concrete below. Meanwhile, Peyton faced a more daunting challenge with her adversary. The towering zombie bearing down on her stood well over six feet tall, its muscular frame presenting a formidable obstacle. Unlike Chad's straightforward approach, Peyton knew she couldn't afford to meet the creature head-on, as such a maneuver would likely result in her being flattened on the unforgiving ground. Assessing her options swiftly, Peyton recognized that her best chance lay in incapacitating the zombie by bringing it to the ground. As the creature closed in on her, she dropped low, wielding her baton with determination as she aimed a powerful strike toward its ankle. The sickening sound of bones snapping echoed through the air as their paths intersected, but to Peyton's dismay, the zombie remained upright, albeit momentarily disoriented. Regaining its bearings, the creature lunged forward with renewed aggression, closing the distance between them in a menacing stride. Backpedaling rapidly, Peyton attempted to put distance between herself and the relentless assailant, but her efforts were thwarted as the zombie seized hold of her non-dominant arm with a vice-like grip. Reacting instinctively, she swung her baton with all her strength, the force of the blow shattering the creature's nose, yet failing to deter its relentless advance. Desperation mounting, Peyton launched another fear strike, pouring every ounce of her remaining strength into the attack. The baton connected with the side of the creature's face, glancing off and striking its shoulder before slipping from her grasp. A cry of anguish escaped her lips as the zombie closed in, her plea for assistance directed toward her comrade. Chad, help, she cried out. Peyton raised both hands in a desperate attempt to fend off the zombie's snapping jaws, her heart pounding with fear as the creature's grip tightened around her. Despite her efforts, she could feel herself losing ground with each passing moment, the relentless advance of the undead bringing it perilously close to sinking its teeth into her flesh. With one final, anguished scream, Peyton braced herself. 
But just as the zombie's gnashing maw loomed inches from her face, its head suddenly snapped violently to the side, its grip faltering as it crumpled to the ground. Startled, Peyton turned to see Chad standing behind the fallen creature, his weapon raised high after delivering the decisive blow. Relief flooded through her as she met Chad's gaze, her breath coming in ragged gasps. Are you good? You're not bitten, are you? He inquired, concern etched in his features. I'm all right, Peyton replied shakily, her voice trembling with the aftermath of the encounter. But that was a lot closer than I would have liked. As Justin rushed over, returning Peyton's weapon to her, she offered him a grateful nod of acknowledgement. Thank you. Turning their attention to their next course of action, Chad queried, where are we going? Just stay to the left, Justin advised. There's a narrow path that'll take us to the far track. Should be parked on the furthest one. Chad's brow furrowed in concern. Is anybody else supposed to be down here? Justin shrugged. Maybe a couple of maintenance guys. Peyton's expression darkened as she voiced her concern. So no passengers. Justin shook his head solemnly. Not unless they jumped down off the platforms and ran over the tracks to get here. So we should be ready for anything, Peyton stated. Yep. Come on, stay close, Chad replied. With determined strides, the trio navigated swiftly across the dimly lit platform toward the looming presence of the trains. It didn't take long for them to spot the tracks ahead, as well as the narrow walkway that Justin had described. As they approached, Chad halted them in their tracks at the sound of ominous moans and shuffling movements emanating from the direction of the tracks. The noise grew louder with each step, sending a chill down their spines. Holy shit, Chad muttered under his breath, his eyes widening in disbelief. The three of them stood shoulder to shoulder, transfixed by the sight before them. Across the tracks, a horde of figures lurked, their movements erratic and predatory, a few dozen strong and seemingly on the hunt for prey. They remained frozen in stunned silence, the imminent danger looming just 50 yards and a couple of train tracks away, with no direct path of escape. Finally, Chad shook himself from his reverie, rousing the others with a tap on their shoulders. With a shared sense of urgency, they pressed forward toward the narrow pathway that hugged the back wall of the tracks, its width barely accommodating their passage. As they approached the parking areas for the train cars, they noted that only a few were occupied with the first two trains appearing to be in a state of disrepair, missing doors and showing signs of extensive maintenance. However, their target lay at the far end. There she is, Justin announced. His voice barely rose above a whisper, yet it was enough to draw the attention of the target train. Inside its confines, three figures stirred in the shadows, their movements quick and anxious as they scanned for the origin of the sound. All three survivors swiftly ducked into the shadows, praying they hadn't been detected. After a tense moment, the creatures relaxed and resumed their patrol. Rather than risk speaking aloud, Chad retrieved his phone and tapped out a message, what now? Justin seized the device, adding, we need to lure them off the train. Peyton gestured for the phone, typing, but what if there are others aboard? It's a large train, after all. Justin shook his head upon reading the message, typing, I locked down the train before parking. The only unlocked doors are the ones here. With a nod of understanding, the trio returned their focus to the train, contemplating how to clear it. Eventually, Chad typed out, where are the door releases? Justin simply pointed to the closest cab and mimed driving motions. Chad scrutinized the train further, noting that the creatures had no apparent access to that section, and the window was open. He resumed typing, addressing Peyton. I want you and Justin to get inside the cab. When I give the signal, open the doors and immediately begin reversing the train. Initially perplexed, Peyton eventually caught on and nodded in agreement. She smacked Justin on the shoulder, urging him to follow. The trio crept forward silently, sticking to the shadows as they approached the train. About 10 yards away, Chad halted, keeping a vigilant watch over the creatures inside, ensuring they remained contained. Justin and Peyton reached the train cab, gingerly opening the window. 
confirming that the interior door was shut. Justin assisted Peyton into the cab before slipping in himself. Once settled, they glanced toward Chad, who offered a half-hearted thumbs up. With a deep breath, Chad signaled them to start the train and release the doors. As soon as the doors swung open on both sides, Chad emerged from the shadows, shouting and banging his crowbar on the ground. I'm out here, assholes. He bellowed. In a matter of seconds, the zombies inside the train surged out from the sides, and Chad wasted no time in sprinting down the walkway ahead of the train, desperately trying to maintain a lead. Meanwhile, Justin operated the train controls, setting it in motion. Though it gained speed quickly, it moved slow enough for Chad to keep pace, but unfortunately, the zombies were just as swift. Chad raced alongside the moving train, reaching the door and leaping inside. However, his landing wasn't as graceful as he had hoped, and he stumbled, crashing to the floor. Chad exclaimed, I'm in. I'm in, as he hurriedly entered through the doors. However, before they could seal shut, a zombie leaped inside, sharing Chad's fate as it stumbled and collapsed onto the floor. Chad, seizing the moment, rolled out of harm's way. With swift movements, Chad regained his footing just as the creature rose to its feet. It lunged towards him, snapping its jaws and clawing at anything within reach. Chad skillfully parried the zombie's attacks, maneuvering himself to grab hold of its back and forcefully push it face first into a nearby seat. As the creature writhed in protest, Chad seized it by the shirt and hauled it upright. Utilizing his strength advantage, he propelled the struggling ghoul towards the still open door. With determination, Chad guided the thrashing monster to the threshold where it made no effort to resist its inevitable departure. Grinning in triumph, Chad remarked, I think this is your stop. Chad exerted all his strength, propelling the zombie forward with a mighty shove that sent it hurtling out the door. He witnessed with grim satisfaction as the creature collided with a concrete beam, meeting its obliteration. After composing himself, he approached the driver's door and knocked firmly. I said I'm in. Why in the hell didn't you close the doors? Chad demanded as the door swung open, revealing Peyton with a smirk playing on her lips. What? Chad's confusion deepened as Peyton gestured towards a monitor displaying a camera feed focused on the front car. I saw that you had company, and I figured that you might want a way to escort him off. He didn't look like he had a ticket, Peyton explained with a hint of mischief. Chad's initial standoffishness melted away replaced by a relieved smile as he turned to Justin. So, how are we looking there, Conductor? He inquired. Just have to back it up and get us pointed in the right direction, and we're good to go, Justin replied confidently. With a nod of acknowledgement, Chad made his way to a seat in the train car, sinking into it with a deep sigh of relief, grateful to have survived the harrowing encounter. Chapter 7 The group stood in the train compartment, their bodies still from exhaustion as Justin maneuvered the train to face the right direction. Peyton settled into a seat behind Chad, who appeared lost in thought, a hint of disbelief creeping into his expression. You doing all right there? Peyton asked, breaking the silence. Chad's gaze remained fixed ahead as he replied, Yeah, it's just, I made the mistake of letting my mind wander for a moment. Peyton reassured him, Nothing wrong with that. It is if we're going to live through this, Chad responded with a touch of urgency. We have time to get refocused before more trouble. Get it off your chest, Peyton encouraged. After a pause, Chad relented to the gentle prodding, just thinking about Mindy and how I'm leaving her behind. Tried her phone, but it went straight to voicemail. Is Mindy your wife? Peyton inquired. Chad burst into laughter, shaking his head. Oh God, no. Mindy is a stripper. Peyton was momentarily taken aback before Chad elaborated, but we've been seeing each other on and off for the last few months. I thought it might be getting serious, or at least as serious things can get with a stripper. Peyton managed to chuckle, trying to maintain a composed demeanor. Things can get serious with strippers. Chad chuckled, his head still shaking with amusement. Oh, to be young and naive. I remember those days. So innocent, he remarked, reminiscing. 
In a playful gesture, Peyton smacked him on the arm, prompting laughter from both of them as they sought relief from the tension. So what about you? Chad inquired. Peyton's expression shifted abruptly, the humor fading from her face, catching Chad off guard. Oh, I'm sorry, you don't have to. Chad started to backtrack. It's okay, you shared so I should too, right? Peyton interjected, her tone gentle yet resolute. Only if you want to, Chad replied, his tone softening. I'm going to have to deal with it eventually, Peyton stated, taking a deep breath before continuing. I was out at a club with my sister and some of our friends for her birthday. Things went bad. Chad nodded in understanding, piecing together the unspoken details. I'm sorry, Peyton. I didn't mean to, Chad began, but Peyton raised her hand to halt his words. It's okay. I know you didn't mean any harm, she reassured him. And besides, if this thing is bigger than just Manhattan, I get the sense we're all going to lose people, Peyton added solemnly. Chad nodded in agreement as they both shifted in their seats when the train reached the turnaround point. Justin leaned out from the open cab door. All right, you two ready to do this? Justin asked. As ready as we're ever going to be, Peyton replied. Here we go then, Justin said as he pushed the throttle and the train began to accelerate. It's usually a 15-minute ride, but I'm going to keep it slow in case there's stuff on the tracks. So 20, 25 minutes okay? Justin informed them. As long as we get there in one piece, I'm good with it, Chad affirmed. I'm in no hurry, Peyton added. Okay then, slow and steady it is, Justin confirmed. As the train rumbled forward, the radio in the cab suddenly erupted with the voice of an angry woman. Train 42, just what in the holy hell do you think you're doing? The voice from dispatch boomed. Justin glanced back at the others, who were taken aback. They hurriedly made their way to the radio to listen in. Dispatch, what in the hell are you still doing there? Justin retorted. What do you mean, what am I doing here? I'm doing my job, which is something you shouldn't be doing on that train right now. So I'll ask again. Just what in the holy hell are you doing? The dispatch demanded. Is there nothing going wrong where you are? Justin countered. Just your dumbass taking a train that's out of service out for a joyride, came the biting reply. Peyton interjected. Where is the dispatch at? Maybe what's going on in Manhattan isn't happening there. It's out in Jersey City somewhere, I think, Justin responded. Tell them to look outside, Chad suggested. Dispatch, I need you to listen to me. There's been an attack in Manhattan, and we're escaping it the only way we can, Justin pleaded. Stop your bullshitting. I have the radio on right now, and if there was some sort of attack, they would have mentioned it by now. And I can see the skyline from the window, and it's as quiet as can be, the dispatch retorted. It's not a bomb and explosion kind of attack. There's something biological that's been released, drives people crazy to the point where they kill, Justin explained urgently. You've been watching too many movies, honey, came the dismissive response from dispatch. Justin's demeanor shifted into one of grave seriousness. I've watched people die tonight, he said, his voice heavy with the weight of what he'd witnessed. Their flesh ripped from their bones by normal people. You need to believe me that there's something going on. The dispatcher remained silent for several moments, the gravity of Justin's words sinking in before responding. I see that you're going at half speed. If you increase that at all, I'm going to get the police involved, came the dispatcher's measured reply. So you believe me? Justin pressed. My brother lives in Manhattan. I'm going to give him a call and see what's what. I'll be right back, the dispatcher said. Okay, my hand is off the throttle, Justin acknowledged. The line went dead as the trio exchanged worried glances and murmured among themselves. So if they don't believe us, what can they do? Peyton asked. They can certainly get the police involved and have them waiting for us at the Jersey station, Justin remarked grimly gesturing to the blood staining their clothes. I'm sure they'd have a field day with the way we look at the moment, he added. 
That's assuming that it hasn't spread to Jersey yet, Peyton interjected. If that happens, I don't think we're going to have to worry about the police, Chad remarked. Suddenly, the prospect of getting arrested doesn't sound so bad, Peyton admitted. Chad couldn't help but let out a chuckle as the dispatcher's voice crackled back onto the line. Her tone had shifted from anger to one of concern. You still there, 42? she asked. We're still here, dispatch. Are you doing okay? Justin's voice held a note of genuine worry. I just talked to my brother, and I think I may have gotten him hurt. The dispatcher confessed, her voice trembling with guilt. Oh God, dispatch, what happened? Justin's concern deepened. My call woke him up, and I told him what you told me, that something was going on. He heard a commotion in his hallway and went to check it out. Next thing I know, I hear the phone hit the ground and him letting out a scream. The dispatcher explained, her distress palpable, even through the phone line. I'm sorry, dispatch. But you didn't hurt him. Whatever is happening in Manhattan hurt him, Justin replied. I just looked out my window too, she added. The dispatcher's voice trailed off and the trio tensed, waiting for her to continue. It's a quiet neighborhood here, you know, just a bar and restaurant right down the street. Worst thing we have here is a horn honking at two in the morning. But I saw people running around like a fight was breaking out, the dispatcher revealed, her words sending a chill down their spines. You're going to be okay, dispatch. Now, I want you to get off the line with me and make sure that your doors are locked. Can you do that for me? Justin said. Oh, they are, honey, they are. If you don't have a key card, those doors don't open. The dispatcher replied. Okay, good. I just want to make sure you're safe. Now, have you heard from anybody else out there on the rails about any trouble? Justin inquired. Not in my department. Only other train on this route is automated, so I'm just watching lights on a path. But when I'm done with you, I'll let the other drivers know something's going on, the dispatcher responded. Good. Now dispatch, I don't suppose you could do me a favor, could you? Justin queried. I'll do my best. What do you need? She replied. We're going to be pulling into the Jersey Terminal here soon, and we need a train that'll get us as far out of town as possible. I don't suppose you could help us out with that, could you? Justin asked. Give me just a minute. The line stayed open as the dispatcher clicked on a keyboard. She muttered to herself before forming full sentences again. OK-42, I got good news and bad news, the dispatcher announced. Frankly, we're just happy that there's good news. Not a lot of that going around today. What do you have for me? Justin inquired. I have the train you're looking for, and it's sitting on track number eight. It's back from its last trip of the day, so it's not going anywhere. And the bad news? Justin pressed. You're going to be coming in on track number two, the dispatcher disclosed. An audible sigh filled the cab, resonating within each of the three survivors as they absorbed the message simultaneously. Justin's voice broke through the tension, nothing you can do to get us closer. Afraid not, honey, dispatch's response came through the crackling radio. You're on the transfer train, and there's only two tracks I can get you on and number two is the closest I can get you. I appreciate that, dispatch, Justin replied, a tinge of gratitude evident in his tone. Now you be safe out there, dispatch continued. I'm going to go do my part to let everybody else know what's happening. And once you do that, dispatch, you get someplace safe, Justin urged. You better believe it, honey. The line went dead as Justin nudged the throttle a little more the train picking up speed. So it's happening in Jersey too. Chad's voice cut in. It didn't sound like it was nearly as widespread though, Peyton replied, attempting to inject a note of optimism. One can only hope, Chad muttered. We're coming out of the tunnel in a moment, Justin announced, anticipation lacing his words. Should give us a good look at the city. Chad and Peyton retreated to the car's windows eager to catch a glimpse of the skyline. As the train emerged from the darkness, moonlight bathed the car, revealing a serene cityscape. 
Several buildings in Manhattan were illuminated, with lights shining from several floors where people worked late into the night. Almost looks peaceful, Peyton said. It's a damn shame we know otherwise, Chad responded grimly. I wish there was a way we could warn people, Peyton sighed, her brows furrowing with concern. Because when they start leaving for work before the sun comes up, it's going to be a slaughter. We could always try calling one of the television stations, Chad suggested, a touch of cynicism in his tone. They're always looking for stuff like this. You know, if it bleeds, it leads. If you took that call, would you believe us? Peyton questioned. I don't suppose I would, Chad admitted with a self-deprecating chuckle. Of course, I was dating a stripper, so I'm not sure my judgment should be the standard bearer. Both of them shared a brief laugh, a momentary release of tension, before refocusing on the gravity of their situation as they neared the other side of the river. Keep an eye out as we go by, Justin instructed. We should be able to see a few streets before going underground again. Nodding in acknowledgement, Peyton and Chad moved to the windows, their gazes scanning the surroundings for any signs of trouble as they crossed the water. Justin slowed the train down to afford them a better view. Their tension eased slightly when they observed nothing but quiet streets passing by. Are you seeing anything? Because I got nothing. Chad inquired, breaking the silence. I don't see anything either, Peyton confirmed. But it looks like it's a residential area. If we were seeing stuff, then we'd be in bigger trouble than we already are. Fair enough, Chad conceded. A moment later, the train plunged into a tunnel, descending towards the station. Okay, let's get geared up, Justin declared. Just a couple more minutes and we'll be there. Exchanging a brief glance, Peyton and Chad readied their weapons, their focus sharpening as they prepared for what lay ahead. Chapter 8 Peyton and Chad gazed out of the train's windows, watching as it crept slowly into the station. The area was brightly illuminated yet eerily deserted. Shouldn't there be more people here, or any people? Peyton voiced her unease. One would think, Chad agreed, his brow furrowing with concern. He paused briefly before calling out to Justin. Don't pull all the way in. Stop it right at the edge of the platform, Chad instructed. Justin, puzzled, questioned, why? Because it's 200 yards to the exit, which is the only place I can think of for anybody to hide, Chad explained. So if there were people here hiding, they might be keeping the attention of those things, Peyton conjectured. I might be crazy, but that's my thought, Chad admitted. I'd rather play it safe. We'll stop just short, Justin decided. With a gentle deceleration, Justin slowed the train to a crawl, avoiding the screech of metal on metal that would come with abrupt braking. Though not entirely silent, the hush was sufficient. Justin peered ahead, his gaze fixed on the main platform leading to an exit, but saw no signs of movement. You two, get in here, Justin called to the others. Complying, the group gathered around the front window as Justin pointed out their next move. We're on track two. We need to haul ass over to the right to get to track eight, Justin directed. They glanced over and saw several open tracks obstructed by a couple of stationary trains standing between them and their path to freedom. How are we getting in? Peyton inquired, her voice edged with urgency. Same deal as before. Jump in through the driver's window and hit the button, Justin replied without hesitation. And if we don't have the time for that, Chad asked. These are safety doors. If you pull on them hard enough, they'll release, but there's a problem with that, Justin explained. At this point, I'd be offended if there wasn't, Chad quipped sarcastically. If the doors are pulled open in an emergency manner like that, they'll stay open for 30 seconds. So if you're being chased and do that, be prepared to stand your ground, Justin cautioned. Fantastic. Chad muttered dryly. Let's get moving, Peyton urged, determination coloring her tone. The two men nodded in agreement as they opened the door to the platform. With cautious steps, they ventured out, their weapons held firmly as they approached the main platform. 
Midway down, they halted abruptly at the faint sounds of moans and thuds against glass. Exchanging worried glances, they resumed their advance, homing in on the disturbance. Peyton grasped Chad's arm, bringing him to a stop as she spotted the source. She pointed towards the windows of the train on track one, where they could see a dozen creatures pressing against a small information booth. Despite their concerted efforts, discerning what had captured the creature's focus remained elusive to them, though they surmised it could be a survivor or someone succumbing slowly to bites. Nonetheless, they felt powerless to intervene, prompting Chad to signal for them to continue forward. Approaching the end of the platform, which extended to the primary horizontal platform leading to the others, a sound from the opposite side of the train halted their progress. Chad cautiously peeked around the train, Identifying the source of the disturbance, a lone zombie, lacking a leg, struggled futilely to rise, repeatedly falling in its efforts. Contemplating briefly, Chad weighed the option of dispatching the zombie but ultimately gestured for the others to proceed. Stepping out from cover, they commenced their movement, only to draw the creature's attention as it turned toward them. Though incapacitated in its pursuit, the creature emitted a harrowing moan its reverberations filling the cavernous space. They looked past it, observing half of the zombies at the kiosk shifting their focus in their direction. Run. Peyton's urgent command propelled the trio into action, their strides quickening as the zombies began to give chase, their relentless pace matching their own. Realization dawned on Chad they wouldn't have time to unlock the doors and seek refuge before the undead horde reached them, and confronting them head-on was out of the question given their numbers. Get that train moving, I'll hold them off, Chad yelled. Chad halted at the platform adjacent to the second to last train, swiftly crossing over and wrenching open its door before retreating to the main platform. With his crowbar poised for combat, he steeled himself for the impending onslaught. Meanwhile, Justin and Peyton raced onward, their focus trained on their designated train and the cab window. While Justin labored at the entrance, Peyton stood sentinel, vigilant against encroaching threats. As Chad surveyed the approaching horde of ten creatures, one broke away from the pack, with several others behind getting their feet tangled and falling. With a determined swing, Chad's crowbar connected with the creature's skull, sending it tumbling off the platform and onto the tracks below. Glancing back to check on Justin and Peyton's progress, he found them still struggling to gain entry. Hurry up! Chad's urgent plea echoed across the platform. Chad pivoted back towards the advancing creatures their relentless pursuit urging him into a frenzied retreat. Instead of engaging in combat, he sprinted along the platform, his voice erupting in a primal scream while he pounded the crowbar against the ground, creating a cacophony of noise. Diving through the train's doorway, Chad didn't let up on his uproar. Glancing backward, he saw a swarm of the undead trailing close behind him. In the lead car of the train, Chad's heart raced as he dashed towards the connecting door, desperately striving to gain enough time to unlatch it. Just as his fingers grasped the handle, he felt the zombie's presence closing in. Damn it. Chad cursed, his frustration boiling over. Whirling around, he swung the weapon with all his might, the forceful blow connecting with the nearest creature's skull, sending it crashing to the ground. Before he could ready himself for another strike, another assailant lunged forward, propelling both of them through the open door. Chad crashed heavily onto the floor, the impact driving the air from his lungs. Grappling with the creature, Chad seized its neck, driving the tip of his crowbar into its flesh. Yet before he could disengage, three more zombies descended upon him, their combined weight pinning him down. Despite his valiant efforts to fend them off, their relentless assault overwhelmed him. A piercing scream escaped Chad's lips as the gnashing teeth of one zombie tore into his leg searing pain igniting his senses. Summoning reserves of strength fueled by adrenaline, he shoved the writhing mass of undead aside, rising to his feet despite the agony coursing through him. Thrashing wildly, Chad swung his crowbar with reckless abandon, managing to dispatch one attacker. However, the remaining zombies surged forward, crashing him against the unyielding metal door of the adjacent car. His screams mingled with the sounds of tearing flesh as the relentless onslaught overpowered him, darkness descending as life ebbed from his body. 
Meanwhile, Justin persisted in his efforts to breach the window while Peyton's attention remained fixed on Chad, who had drawn most of the creatures away with his desperate flight down the platform. Unbeknownst to them, two of the ghouls remained undeterred, closing in on their position. Get in there. Peyton's urgent command spurred Justin into action. Peyton's weapon sliced through the air, connecting with the first approaching creature with a resounding thud, sending the ghoul crashing to the ground. Just as another lurched toward her, Justin sprang into action, flinging the window open and urging her onward. Get to the door. Justin's urgent command spurred Peyton into motion. She darted ahead, Justin's assistance allowing her a fleeting lead as she burst through the door, readying herself for the impending clash. But the zombie was relentless, its outstretched arm wedging the door ajar despite Justin's efforts to shut it. Peyton wasted no time, raining down blows upon the creature's skull with all her might, the sickening crack of bone echoing through the confined space. With the threat neutralized, Peyton spared no mercy, delivering a few more strikes to ensure the ghoul remained incapacitated. As she caught her breath, Justin's voice broke the tense silence. Let me know when you see Chad, and I'll open up for him. Justin's words signaled a brief reprieve as Peyton turned her attention to the windows, scanning the adjacent train. A sudden cry escaped her lips, her heart sinking as she beheld the sight of Chad engulfed by a horde of undead assailants. A flicker of hope ignited as Chad fought back, but it was swiftly extinguished as he succumbed once more to the overwhelming onslaught. Tears threatened to overwhelm her as Peyton reluctantly faced Justin once more. He's not going to make it, she whispered, her voice heavy with resignation. What? Are you sure? He's a tough son of a bitch, I'm sure. Justin's voice trailed off, disbelief mingling with a hint of denial. Peyton's voice trembled with grief. Each word strained as she uttered them. He's gone. We have to get out of here. Justin's acknowledgement was slow, a solemn nod preceding his return to the controls. With a determined push of the throttle, the train lurched into motion, carrying them away from the nightmarish scene outside. Standing by the window, Peyton watched in mournful silence as the relentless creatures tore Chad's body asunder. A final farewell whispered into the void. Thank you, Chad, she murmured, her voice barely audible amidst the chaos. Her strength faltered, knees buckling beneath her, as she sought solace in the embrace of a nearby seat. The weight of loss crashed over her, a torrent of emotions threatening to engulf her weary soul. Her mind drifted to her sister, her friends, and the countless lives lost. Their home, now a distant memory, added to the burden of her sorrow. Lost in the depths of despair, Peyton found herself adrift, uncertain of their destination or the company she kept. Yet, amidst the uncertainty, one truth remained, the urgency of escaping the city's clutches. Justin's voice broke through the haze, drawing her back to the present moment. Hey, you might want to come hear this. Summoning her resolve, Peyton rose from her seat, making her way to the front cab where Justin awaited. What is it? She inquired, anticipation mingling with apprehension. I found a radio station. The news is getting ready to come on, Justin replied. Peyton leaned in closer, listening intently as the familiar cadence of the news broadcast filled the airwaves. It's one in the morning in the Big Apple. I'm Angela Smith, and these are your headlines. Tensions in the Middle East continue to rise after. Justin was confused, turning his gaze to Peyton, who mirrored his perplexity. She said it was one in the morning, so we know it's live. How are they not reporting on what's going on? Peyton queried. Maybe they don't have enough information? Or they might not even be aware of it yet? Justin speculated. It's been happening for at least two hours now. Surely someone would, would know about it, Peyton countered. I don't know. Peyton. All I know is we're on a train and we're heading as far away from here as possible, Justin stated with a sense of urgency. Do you know where it's taking us? Peyton inquired, searching for answers. Justin shook his head. I don't. All I know is that it's heading beyond the densely populated areas. 
Any idea what to do when we get there? Peyton pressed further. None whatsoever. Not sure if you know this or not, but you're the brains of this operation, Justin remarked with a hint of admiration. Peyton managed a forced chuckle, acknowledging the responsibility placed on her shoulders, before she nodded and retreated to her seat. I'll see what I can come up with then, she responded. Justin nodded and redirected his attention to the controls as Peyton settled back into her seat. She gazed out the window, the tunnel's flashing lights painting her face with fleeting patterns, her mind racing with thoughts of their next steps once they reached their final destination. Suddenly, an idea ignited within her. Hey, Justin, Peyton called out. Yeah? Justin responded, turning his focus back to her. How do you feel about camping? Peyton proposed. I'm more of a pampered spa day kind of guy, but recent events have opened me up to the idea. Justin replied, a hint of newfound flexibility in his tone. Then that's what we're going to do. Grab a car, hit a super center, buy everything we can think of, and head for the hills, Peyton declared with determination. Not sure how much we're going to be able to buy. I only got about 40 bucks on me, Justin admitted. Peyton smirked mischievously, reaching into her bra and producing a gold credit card. Corporate card, no limit. And I don't have to worry about being fired for using it either, she revealed. One last shopping spree before the end of the world, Justin remarked with a mix of amusement and resignation. Peyton smiled faintly as Justin retreated back into the cab, the train accelerating. She returned her gaze to the passing scenery as they emerged from the underground tunnel onto a bridge. The moon hung high in the sky, casting its serene glow over the rows of houses below. For now, all was calm. Peyton could only hope that the farther they ventured from the city, the more peaceful their surroundings would become. Their survival depended on it. The End